in, um, in 1869, Samuel Clements, AKA Mark Twain, published The Innocents Abroad, which was a travelogue um, illustrated with sketches of an excursion that he joined to the cities of the old world in Europe, and then on to an older world yet in Syria and Palestine, which his party traversed on horseback. The book, The Innocents Abroad, is a marvelous read. It is insightful, thoughtful, and hysterically funny, and it made Mark Twain famous. When he gets to Syria and Palestine, his excellent knowledge of scripture, combined with his unrivaled wit, gives a running commentary from a land that had changed little since biblical days. Soon after entering Palestine and seeing the first sights and experiencing the customs, he writes, I can see easily enough that if I wish to profit by this tour and come to a correct understanding of the matters of interest connected with it, I must studiously and faithfully unlearn a great many things I have somehow absorbed concerning Palestine. And then in the same part of the book, he gives an example of the type of thing that he needs to unlearn as he sees the indigenous people in their travels through the country. They wore the party colored half bonnet, half hood, with fringed, uh, uh, fringed ends falling upon their shoulders and the full flowing robe barred with broad black stripes, the dress one sees in all the pictures of the swarthy sons of the desert. They have the manners, the customs, the dress, the occupation of the ancient stock. They had with them the pygmy jackasses one sees all over Syria and remembers in all pictures of the flight into Egypt where Mary and the young child are riding and Joseph is walking alongside, towering high over the little donkey's shoulders. But really, here, the man rides and carries the child as a general thing, and the woman walks. The customs have not changed since Joseph's time. We would not have in our houses a picture representing Joseph riding and Mary walking. We would see profanation in it. But a Syrian Christian would not. I know that hereafter, the picture that I first spoke of will look odd to me. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning at Forge Road Bible Chapel, both those who are here and those who are joining us online. We're going to be working today from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Happy Father's Day to all the dads who are here and to who are, those who are listening on this, your special day. Dads, you are great. You are the heroes of your children. You are the champion of your wife. You are the provider, protector, guardian, and covering of your home. Fatherhood is undervalued in our society. According to the latest census figures, 19.7 million children in America, that's more than one in four, live in a home without a father. The societal impact of the pandemic of father absence and the devaluation of fatherhood is beyond calculation. This morning, I want to set out with you on the search for the most famous father nobody knows, Joseph, the father of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Joseph was not his biological father. Je Jesus was conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. But Joseph was his father in every other respect. He was the man who raised him, instructed him, taught him, prepared him for life, and perhaps had a greater role in shaping his character than any other person. We all exhibit traits of our parents. I cannot count how many times I have been told that I sound like my father, Alan. But before Jerusalem would call Jesus the son of David, and before Peter would call Jesus the son of the living God, the people of Nazareth called him the son of Joseph. We talk a lot about how Jesus is like David and how Jesus is the embodiment of the living God. In what ways was he like Joseph? 
In what ways was he like Mary? We don't often talk about the formative years of Jesus' life. We talk about him as changeless, as God the Son, eternity, e eternally with the Father, who took on flesh to walk among us. And all of that is true. And yet, we also read that Jesus increased. He increased in wisdom, just as he increased in stature. He increased with favor of God, just as he increased in favor with man. To what extent can that increase be traced to Joseph or to Mary? I often think that speakers do a less than outstanding job when discussing what we call the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that he is both God and man. Often we try to describe this mystery by meshing the two concepts together to try to explain and reconcile them. And I submit that that is the wrong way to study this subject. It's a poor intellectual tool. It's a self-limiting exercise that the scripture itself never undertakes. When the scripture presents him, presents his deity, that he is the son of God, it is unrestricted by human limitation. And when the scripture presents his humanity as the son of man, the son of Joseph, it is not confounded by his eternal power and knowledge. So rather than try to reconcile the two, it bursts the bounds of our intellect and takes us out deeper each way. That is the path I want to follow with you today. But I have a second reason for taking up this subject. I would like to talk with you about the gospel of Jesus Christ as the great engine for social change in the world. There is much being written and a great much being said right now about social justice and equality. There is a great spread of opinions advanced in the public forum, and the attention of the nation has been forcibly turned to these questions. Last week, we heard of the exhortation of Mordecai to Esther that she could not remain silent in such a time as this. The Church of Jesus Christ should take such instruction. We cannot remain silent in such a time as this. Now, truth be told, the text and subject of today's message were decided upon last October, in October of 2019. I have some responsibility for scheduling the speakers and the subjects of these meetings, and when working on the schedule for 2020, I thought to take Father's Day with the idea of speaking on the formative years of Jesus of Nazareth, how his ministry was a great force for social change, and what that might show us about Joseph and Mary. The majority of what I'm going to say today was written months ago. Now, I do not say that to suggest that I am somehow clairvoyant or particularly perceptive, because I am not. And neither do I claim or even suggest that the Lord laid this on my heart for today, knowing what would happen so as to endow these comments with any unusual authority. Actually, I take exactly the opposite exhortation to myself, that societal issues, both the problems of our society and the greatness and accomplishments of American society, are not things that we should talk about only on special times that compel our attention, but things that we should be talking about together often in the regular course of the application of biblical principles to our lives. For the gospel and the salvation, and the, for, for the gospel and the scriptures have always been the great exposition of personal and national morality, and so the great engine of social change. Never was this more evident than on December 5, 1955, at the Holt Street Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. This morning we sang Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, which I asked for because that was the congregational hymn that was sung that night at a meeting called of the Negro Churches in Montgomery four days after the arrest of Rosa Parks. A huge crowd gathered, filling the church, and with many in the street who heard over loudspeaker. Dr. Martin Luther King, 
pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, gave his first speech as a public figure that night as he called for the Montgomery bus boycott. His language was typical of the speeches that marked the civil rights movement, language that was determined but never angry. It was hopeful but always exceedingly practical. And most of all, it was language that was overtly and expressly Christian. We are here today also because of our love for democracy, because of our deep-seated belief that democracy transformed from thin paper to thick action is the greatest form of government on earth. Mrs. Rosa Parks is a fine person, and since it had to happen, I'm happy that it happened to a person like Mrs. Parks, for nobody can doubt the boundless outreach of her integrity. Nobody can doubt the height of her character. Nobody can doubt the depth of her Christian commitment and devotion to the teachings of Jesus. I want it known throughout Montgomery and throughout the nation that we are a Christian people. We believe in the Christian religion. We believe in the teachings of Jesus. The speech is about 14 minutes. Uh, you can listen to it on the internet. And it's famous for a riff that Dr. King went on as he was off to do. He said, and we are not wrong. We are not wrong in what we are doing. If we are wrong, the Supreme Court of this nation is wrong. If we are wrong, the Constitution of the United States is wrong. If we are wrong, the Lord God Almighty is wrong. If we are wrong, Jesus of Nazareth was merely a utopian dreamer who never came down to earth. He was 26 years old when he made that speech. 26. And he had 12 years and four months left to live. I think that we have greatly sanitized the gospel story in our off telling of it. Jesus is often pictured as something of a utopian dreamer sitting on the side of a hill or by a lake talking about birds and flowers and loving one another. The gospel narrative does not take place in the quiet pastoral setting, but in the cities and towns of a country being torn apart by public conflict and social unrest. Roman Palestine was a place, was a cauldron of class division, race division, political division that was ready to explode and within a generation did explode into the Jewish Roman wars. We can hear that ongoing conflict in the words of Jesus and I submit, in his words, we can hear clues, lots of clues, lots of looks back to his younger days, to his formative years. We're going to look at just one such clue today. So let's go back there, and let's see if we can see this story a little bit differently. And maybe like Mark Twain, we might never look at the, at the picture the same way again. Then Jesus returned in the spirit and the power of the spirit to Galilee. We are starting in verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty all those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? There are but few references in the Old Testament to the Trinity, to the three in one that is the Godhead. But here in Isaiah is one such instance. The Spirit that is the Holy Spirit, of the Lord, that is the Father, 
is upon me. That is the Messiah, the Son. This is a great moment in the ministry of Jesus. It is his public announcement, his claim to be the one ordained by God to bring redemption. There's much that we can draw from this, and sermons without number have been preached about our common salvation, about how in sin we were all blind, we were all captives, and Jesus came to save us all. But the people to whom Isaiah was writing and the people to whom Jesus was speaking needed no spiritual allegory to understand the sense. They were poor. We heard a few weeks ago a message from the Lord's Prayer, and the words, give us this day our daily bread, to them meant exactly that. Lord, give us enough food to eat today so that we don't starve, and we'll let tomorrow take care of itself. They were a captive people. They were oppressed, not only by their Roman conquerors, but by their own religious elite who used their ancient faith to impose on them heavy taxes to hold them down and make themselves rich. Today, there are different opinions as far as the cause of the current unrest, and more importantly, different opinions as, as to what should be done. And I have my opinions, and we all must have ears to hear from one another. But last Friday was Juneteenth which celebrates the end of slavery in the old Confederate states when news of emancipation reached Galveston, Texas. It's also known in Texas as Freedom Day, Liberation Day, Jubilee Day, just the things that Jesus was speaking of here. For certainly we can all agree that the protests have risen up from among those who are largely poor, who have seen more than their share of heartbreak who are descendants of those taken captive and those who have been oppressed. If Jesus came with a, minute, with, with a ministry to heal, to proclaim liberty, and to set at large, then we should join him in that wherever it is found. But for this morning, the Bible rewards attention to detail. And in this chapter, there is something else that is not to be missed. Now, over the past months during the shutdown of the building, the chapel distributed written devotionals as a way to stay in touch and to support one another. This was well received and it's going to be continued going forward. And by the way, so far, all the devotionals have been written by men. And uh, we want the women of the chapel to know that you are certainly invited to this party. I would very much like to read what you have to say, and I'm sure it would be edifying and unifying and a blessing to the body of Christ. There was an excellent devotional that was circulated, authored by Kyle Sobis. He spoke about listening to the scriptures as though you were hearing them for the first time, and the importance of hearing every single word. Well, there is a word here in Luke 4 that is impactful, I will say, essential to our story. Yet it is something that we miss and skip over in our 21st century wor world. It, uh, it is of extreme importance, and it is hiding in plain sight. It is the word, read. These verses record that Jesus of Nazareth stood up to read, and that it was his custom to read publicly in the synagogues. The most thorough and authoritative examination of literacy in the first century, in first century Judea and Galilee, is by Catherine Heltzer, PhD. She is the professor of Jewish studies at the University of London, and it is entitled Jewish Literacy in Roman Palestine, published in 2001. Professor Heltzer is a prolific author in academic and peer-reviewed journals, focusing much of her study on the times, the very times that Jesus was preaching. This is a long, dense, exhaustive study written for an academic audience. It is 557 pages long. It is a very hard read. And it's a great resource. 
So what was the literacy rate in Palestine in the days of Jesus? Well, that depends on what you consider to be literacy. If literacy means the ability to write your name and recognize a few words that are common in society, we would say, can you read a stop sign? I, you know, they didn't have a stop sign, but you get the idea. If literacy means you can write your name and you can read a stop sign, then the literacy rate was about 15%. Anything more than that, like reading a text from Isaiah, and literacy fell to about 3%. That's in one, two, three, that's it, percent. This would be limited to the cultural elite and the religious class and mostly in the cities. Jesus of Nazareth is not from the cities. He is not part of the religious class. And he is as far from the cultural elite as you can get. But Jesus of Nazareth had learned how to read. It was his custom to read in the synagogues. Now, some have noted that young Jewish boys would have rudimentary training to read the Torah, meaning they could recognize enough of it to recite it by rote and so participate in some of the public meetings. And that's true. But that's not this. That's not what's happening here. This isn't the Torah. This is the book of Isaiah. Jesus is handed the scroll, and the book of Isaiah is one big scroll, and it's closed. He opens the book. He finds the place, what we would call Isaiah 61. Now, I can find Isaiah 61 because in my Bible, there's a great big number that says 61 right there on the page. But what Jesus is handed doesn't have chapters, it doesn't have verse numbers, it doesn't have bold lettered headings, it's just text. If somebody handed me a Bible that was just text and told me to find a particular verse in Isaiah, it might take me a while. And look where Jesus decides to stop. Here's Isaiah 61 and Luke 4 side by side. Notice, as we said, this is the words of the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me to preach to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Then notice verse 2 in Isaiah. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. The Messiah would declare both. Both the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. But when Jesus read in the synagogue that day, he proclaimed the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book. Jesus stopped right in the middle of a sentence. That was no mistake. That was no happenstance. He was declaring for them and declaring for us the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of salvation. As the Apostle Paul would write to the Corinthians, behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. The day of God's vengeance is not yet. Jesus closed the book. Now, just taking Luke 4 at face value, Jesus of Nazareth, is fully literate. This is astounding. We take it for granted today, but it was astounding then. This is from the Gospel of John, chapter 7. Jesus, uh, Jesus is in Jerusalem. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters? Now, there's not a lot of commentary that I can find on this. I find some who say, well, he's the son of God, so of course he knows how to read. I mean, you know, he's the son of God. He knows everything. He has, he has to know how to read, you know. And there are others um, who just dismiss this and say, this can't be. This is just Luke making it up. It's impossible. And there are others who suppose that Mary and Joseph, knowing that they had a special charge to raise up the Messiah, brought in special tutors for him. I reject all of those contentions, all of those suggestions, and I contend that he was taught to read growing up in the household of Joseph, Joseph and Mary, who saw value in it. 
and who were centuries ahead of their time. And I think this because there are two other characters in the Bible, in the New Testament, who are also clearly literate. What you see at the top is the opening of the epistle, the letter from James, and below is the epistle, the letter from Jude, the younger brothers of Jesus who grew up in the same household. You know, the New Testament was written mostly by some very educated people. Paul with intense training at the feet of Gamaliel, Luke with his medical degree, Matthew was a Hellenized Jew who ran a tax practice, Mark, Marcus was Roman. Whenever we study 1 Peter, somebody usually notes that uh, Peter was an illiterate fisherman who spoke Aramaic, and this letter is written in highly polished Greek. And at the end of 1 Peter, there's a clear statement that the actual writing is done by Silas. These are some high-powered, Ivy League-educated people. And then there's James and Jude from poor backwater, dirt water Nazareth. How did they get into such a highbrow company? There was a study published in 1907 by Joseph Mayer of Cambridge University comparing the letters of James and Jude in the original languages. He concludes, one, neither of the, le neither of the writers were classically trained. Neither of them had formal schooling. And two, the letters are remarkably similar in their vocabulary and phraseology, which is completely consistent with two boys growing up in the same house. In a society where literacy is about 3% to have, this, to have at least three sons in the same household in Nazareth to be literate, there is no way that's an accident. There's no way that's a coincidence. Joseph and Mary are educating their children far beyond what would be the norm of the time. They knew that they were raising up the Messiah of Israel, but they were also raising six other children. And around dinner in the evening, an instruction in the scriptures, and in the joys of sorrows of life, I choose to believe that there was the same care, the same attention, the same fatherly love distributed to each one of them. They were not only raising the most remarkable child, they were raising a most remarkable family. That Jesus could read is a game changer. It is a world changer. Speaking just in terms of historical significance, on a scale of 1 to 10, this is a 14. It's difficult to, uh, for us to imagine what an illiterate society would look like. People totally dependent on the local scribe or the local priest, or ultimately the high priest in Jerusalem, to tell them what the scripture says. Imagine if there was literacy of 3% here. There are so what? How many people? There so, so, so everybody agrees. Everybody agrees that this governs your life, this governs eternity, but there are only two of us here who can read it. Look at these verses from Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount. Here's Jesus talking to the common populace. You know, you know these verses. You have heard it was said of old, you shall not murder. You, shall hurt, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you should not commit adultery. The understanding of scripture was what you heard. Heard in the synagogue, heard from the rabbis and the priests. Now compare that to how Jesus would challenge the scribes and the Pharisees. Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? Have you not read in the law? Have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female? Have you not, have you not read out of the mouths of babes? Have you not read in the scriptures the stone which the builder rejected? Concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken of? See the difference? See the difference? This is world changing. The 99% lived under oppression, the oppression of the Romans and the oppression of those who use religion to add to their burdens, heavy burdens, Jesus said. And they prayed to God for a champion to deliver them. And now from this illiterate society, there arises a man from the peasant class 
who can stand toe to toe with the Pharisees and the rabbis and even the lawyers and contend with them concerning the scriptures because he can read them. And not only can this man read the scriptures, he is a man passionately committed to them, extremely well-versed, extremely familiar with them. He has obviously read them and read them a lot. You know, it's not inconsistent with human nature that over the centuries, an elite religious class added things to the law of God and subtracted to it, interpreted their way around it to build up around themselves an impregnable wall of supposed authority. And now there comes a man more well-versed, more well-read, more studied in the law and the prophets than they, and a man with every intention of tearing that wall of oppression down. This is from Matthew chapter 15. I know this is a lot of text. It's, he answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandments of God because of your tradition? For God commanded saying, honor your father and your mother and he who curses his father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received from me as a gift of God, then he need not honor his father and mother. Thus you have made the commandments of God of no effect by your tradition, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying in vain, they worship me teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men. I don't want to talk about the substance here. Just want to talk about the style. About watching Jesus of Nazareth handle scripture. Just watch this man go. Matthew 15 is an extemporaneous exchange. It's off the cuff. It's a response to something that's just happening. No prepared study, no prepared remarks. There are three quotes here. The first one is from Exodus. The second one's from Deuteronomy. The third quote is from Isaiah. I needed my Logos Bible software to find these quotes. He didn't. He just knew them cold. He would hit them and the Pharisees would just cover up like a boxer that's getting hit with a flurry of punches coming from every angle. People said of him that he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You know what that sounds like. You've been in church enough. You've listened to enough sermons. You know what it sounds like when somebody speaks with authority. Speak of, think of maybe professors you've had in school or the best Bible teachers you've heard. They speak, people who speak with the authority and the confidence of knowing what they've talked about, what they're talking about, and having studied it out and being committed to what they're saying. And I love to listen, to hear that. And respectfully, you also know what the scribe sounded like with a string of Christian speak cliches and politically correct sound bites and a lot of stuff just filling the requisite time with words. Jesus was excellently learned in the scripture. And I submit that he was, I submit he was trained at home both to be an excellent student generally and to have an excellent knowledge of the scriptures. Up top is an account from Luke 2, a very famous account. Jesus, age 12, is brought to Jerusalem, got separated from his parents. They found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Now, every depiction I've ever seen of this is that Jesus was confounding the teachers, showing them up, which the verse doesn't actually say. The verse says that he was listening to them, that he was learning from them that everybody was astonished at his understanding. Dads, I'll bet you you train your children to learn and to listen. And Joseph did too. And once again, we can see this in the other sons. For James and Jude both exhibited remarkable breadth of knowledge of the scripture. James in his letter. James in his letter writes about Abraham, Isaac, Rahab, Elijah, Job. He effortlessly quotes from Moses, Ezra, Isaiah, and the Proverbs of Solomon. At the Council of Jerusalem, he ended the debate with a quote from Amos. The book of Jude, the book of Jude is 25 verses long, 25 verses, in the course of which Jude references the exodus from Egypt, the trials in the wilderness, the angels who were thrown out of heaven, Sodom, Gomorrah, 
Michael the Archangel, Cain, Balaam, Korah, Enoch, the coming of, the, coming of Christ in the day of the Lord. He handles all that in 25 verses. These young men, they really knew their stuff. The children of Mary and Joseph, they learned the scriptures down to their shoes, or I guess you could say down to their sandals. In Luke chapter 1, Mary exalts in the Lord. And last December, we heard a message on the song of Mary that, the, that, that it was a string of quotes from the prophet, just one after the other. Moses told Israel of the law, you shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you raise up, rise up. And Joseph and Mary... They did. In their household, the scripture was in the ambient air. The impact that that had on the formative years of their oldest son cannot be fathomed. The impact it has had on the history of the world is still being played out. Now, as we wind to a close this morning, I want to return to the theme of the gospel as an agent of social change. And I want to tell you a story. This story takes place in Lawndale. Lawndale is a neighborhood of Chicago. Lawndale uh, was about as bad a place as there was in Chicago, with a story all too familiar in America. I grew up in New Jersey at, uh, with Woodside Chapel as my second home. And as I was growing up there in the late 60s and 70s, it was a place not unlike the meeting here. If you were there, you would recognize it right away. One couple there was Warren and Annalise Lott. Lois, Lois remembers them. They were uh, somewhat older than my parents. They were uh, the type of people who you would recognize right away people who were essential to the meeting, always there, always working, always helping. Warren, I understand, was very close to Lois's father, Art. Warren and Annalise had two daughters, Heidi, and their younger daughter was named Linda, or is named Linda. And Linda is a few years older than I am. She was a few grades, a couple of grades ahead of me in Sunday school. This is Linda right here. And if you are watching this online, uh, she is the white woman right above the words, our history in the second row. Uh, Linda went to uh, Taylor University, Christian school, Taylor University in Illinois. And there she met and married a, a medical student, or maybe he was at the time a recent medical graduate in Illinois, whose name is Art Jones. And that is Art right there. Uh, if you are watching online, he is the, 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 the white man in the first row with the mustache and the big glasses. It was very fashionable then to wear big glasses. Art today has a, he graduated from medical school in 1979, one year before I graduated, graduated from law school. He has a, a long record, a long record of, 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 uh, of achievements and professional accomplishments. But instead of a lucrative Chicago medical practice, Art decided to start a medical clinic in Lawndale. 
and in conjunction with the church there, and you see in this picture the essentially volunteer team that started it, he began the Lawndale Christian Health Center, which is also known as just the Lawndale Miracle. I could talk to you about the center, but you can read that for yourself online. It is now 10 sites throughout West Chicago. You can read the statistics of the thousands of people, the hundreds of thousands of visits each year. The story of how it was formed and the uh, story of the church that was involved is, was told in the book Real Hope for Chicago, which was published in 1995, was written by Wayne Gordon, who is the pastor of that church. And if you'll give me just a couple of extra minutes, I'd like to talk to you about a different part of this story. Because way back at the beginning, 35 years ago, in conjunction with starting the center, Art and Linda did something else. They moved into Lawndale. They moved there with their small children and they decided that they would live their lives there. Some years back, my business took me to Chicago. This was, oh boy, 15, 20 years ago. It took me to Chicago and I was gonna have meetings on Monday. So I went out the weekend before. I hadn't seen Linda in many years and Vicki was gonna come with me. And I called Linda, see if we could get together while I was out there. I knew what was going on. I was following what was going on. When we flew in, uh, she took us on a driving tour of downtown Chicago to see the, the tourist sites. And we said that we really wanted to go to church with them and we got the necessary information. So the next day, Sunday morning, Vicki and I come out of the Hyatt Hotel where we're staying and we call a cab. We, they, they call us a cab, get in the cab. I hand the cab driver the address of where we're going. Vic, what happened? Yeah, he, 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 he basically refused to take us. <laughs> Have you ever gotten in a cab where they said, no, well, I'm not taking you there? He said, why do you want to go there? You do not want to go there. And I said, and we said, oh, yes, yes, we do. And they said, no, no, you don't want to go there. And I, we, we said, why do you want to go? Well, we, we, we want to go to church. Well, he, he thought that there were other churches that we could go to. Uh, uh, you can talk to Vic about her recollection of that cab drive. My recollection is that three times during the drive, he stopped, turned around, and said to me, are you sure you want to go there? Go here. As we drove, Chicago's a big place, as we drove deeper and deeper into that neighborhood. Now, this was not culture shock for Vicki and I. We have both worked with Christian churches and Christian ministries in some of the worst parts of Baltimore City. There have been places where we've gone where they have said to us, do not get out of the car. We will come and get you under no circumstances. Get out of the car. And when we got to this, uh, when we, we got to this church, I do not know what the speed limit was on the road, but I guarantee you that that cab driver was way above it when he was driving out. We went to church and then we went to Art and Linda's home for lunch and to spend Sunday afternoon. Art was a big Chicago Bears fan, so we watched some of the game. And then Art and I went out for a walk together and we walked the streets of Lawndale. We went to the medical clinic, we went to other businesses that he was involved in trying to get started. It seemed like everybody that we met on the street knew Art and that he knew everybody. I began to get the sense that I was walking some of the most dangerous streets in America and it was getting dark. And as long as I was with this guy, I was perfectly safe. He talked about the frustrations he, he had with city government. He talked about efforts to bring back employment. 
And then he said something else. He said to, him, he said to me, you're really not going to make a change unless you actually move in. And that if you're not really willing to move in, then you might not really be serious about solving these problems. And he did not say that to me as a rebuke or a challenge or uh, you should be doing more. He simply said that with the moral authority of a man who had actually counted the cost. The moral authority of a man who had actually thought about how big this problem is and what the cost to solve it is really going to be, and looked at that with a clear eye and was willing to pay it. He never talked to me about what he expected others to do. He never talked to me about what other Christians should be doing. He only talked about what he was willing to do. And I've thought about that over the years. Maybe that, was, that, that is maybe just a great burden that was on his heart. I've thought about it a lot. It's good to measure yourself against people who are better than you. And I've thought about it a lot recently. Now, I believe and have said that we would all see things very differently if we could see how the Lord sees the Lord saw the church at Laodicea and said that they were rich, who said they were rich and increased in goods and had need of nothing, and said that you didn't know that you were poor and miserable and wretched and blind and naked. The streets of Chicago and the streets of Baltimore that think they're rich, the Lord may see is the Lord may see they're the worst of poverty and the most to be pitied. Jesus said how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. From an eternal perspective, the rich places in Chicago or in Baltimore might be far more dangerous than the streets of Lawndale. And I say that, and then I examine my own heart. It is good for Christians, for a Christian to examine his heart. David prayed, Lord, search me and find me out. Paul said, I judge myself. Paul said, I'm not going to let anybody else judge me. In my Christian liberty, no one can judge me. And in your Christian liberty, no one can judge you. And don't let them. There are only two people who can judge me. There are only two people who can judge me. One of them is Jesus Christ who will do it at his judgment seat. And the other one is me, who can do it today. I have to judge whether what I say is because I really believe it or just because I don't want to move to Lawndale. Mark Twain said that for him to know Palestine, he had to go to Palestine. Reading about it in a book was not enough. He had to go. Hart said that if you're going to effectuate change, you have to be willing to move there. And I don't know if that is true. I don't know if that is true, but I know this, that that's what Jesus Christ did. That he was not just a utopian dreamer who never came to earth. He moved here right into the most angry, most violent place in all of creation. He did not effectuate change from afar. He came here, lived here, died here. And what he did changed the world. Thank you for listening to me today. To all the dads who are here, happy Father's Day. To all those to whom last Friday was a special day, happy Juneteenth. To everybody, there is nothing better and nothing more powerful than the gospel of Jesus Christ, and there never will be. 
Thanks for listening to me today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that he indeed came here, that he lived here among us, taught here and worked here and died here. Thank you, Father, that he is raised from the dead. He is at your right hand from whence he is coming to judge the living and the dead. Our Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for the leadership of our nation for good and right and wise decisions, that decisions that are effectual. And we pray our Father, we pray our Father for an open door for the gospel. We pray for that in our neighborhood. We pray for that in our country. We pray that many people would be saved. Our Father, we pray that we would be known as a people who search their hearts, who know your ways, and that in all things strive to please you. We give thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for listening to me today.